have a panel discussion this morning on the book of James. And we did this on a very regular basis when we studied Ephesians. We had Sunday night meetings. And we would come together and they would sit here like this, although I put them on stools for a very specific reason. Nobody needs to get too comfortable, right? Yeah, that's right. So we had these discussion times where we asked for questions for the congregation to get involved and to ask questions. And that's what we're going to do today. Um, we have provided my phone number as well as Phil Gielhood. So if you have questions today, you are going to text us. This is one of the few times in your life we are going to encourage you to get out your cell phones in church and to do some texting during the service. That's okay. Except for Van. Except for Van. <laughs> oh, you're okay. I looked in your section. So if you have a question or if one of the elders says something this morning that you think, now wait a second, can you explain that a little more? Send that follow-up question to one of us and we will try to uh, address that. Um, if we don't get to it this morning, we will have then the record of that and we can keep those and continue that discussion. Uh, my role this morning as moderator is to help keep things moving. I recently attended the uh, senator debate and I watched the moderator, and she cuts people off, okay? She got booed by the crowd because she was cutting people off and keeping things factual. So I'm comfortable with that. You do what you need to do. But we're going to keep things moving. And uh, Phil's here to help with the questions and to keep the questions going with the elders. So the very first thing that we are going to do this morning is ask each elder to give about a three-minute summary, thought, something that stuck out to you from the book of James. So three minutes to each of you, what stuck out to you from the book of James, and then we will start in. Phil might have a question you might want to start with, and then we will go from there. Does that sound okay? Mm -hmm. All right. All right. I guess I'll go first. Um, good morning. Well, the thing that stuck out for me for James was just how real and practical it is. Uh, for those of you who know me, and, and you know, I love movies, and I often refer to different movies when I speak, but James in his teaching was very, like if he had movies back then, he would be referring to them, but like all of the things that he talked about, he had these great vivid word pictures, you know, whether it's the the rudder steering the ship or a flame, uh, just all these different things that, you know, farmers, and just related to things that, that fit and people could relate to. And, but then the other thing that kind of stuck out, is, and I love how we do this when we study the books, is that, you know, often when we hear sermons on, on, on on topics and things, you, you feel like you're taking a piece of the book and you're just like, this one section is what the book is about, or this one section may be about doing good works, or, or this one section may be about taming the tongue. But when you read James and you study it as a whole, you see how it all fits together. It's not a bunch of six or seven different truths, although there are these different truths in it, but there's they all tie together, and they all tie together with this idea of, of how to live out your faith in the midst of suffering and persecutions and trials, and that even in the midst of those things, there's still an authentic Christianity that can be lived out. So, um, so yeah. If you uh, haven't turned to the book of James or on your phone looked it up, uh, it's near the back of the uh, New Testament, near the back of your Bible. Uh, I think I've been reminded again uh, that my attitude and behavior and responses is, is never done in isolation. But it impacts those around me either for good or for evil, for harm. And there's, there's not really anything in between there. And uh, it's just come out uh, in several places in, in the book of James, end of chapter 1, uh, how uh, we have a responsibility as God's people to care for the vulnerable, the widows, 
the orphans, the least of these, and uh, again, in that situation, in that relationship, uh, someone could be so destructive or so helpful in loving and building up. Uh, elsewhere in the book, uh, in chapter, chapter 2, uh, really that whole chapter, but there in verse 8, to, uh, to love our neighbors. Uh, how do we do that? How do we know what it means to, to love in a culture where love is, is, is perverted and upside down and backwards? It's to know God and how He uh, defines love. Uh, chapter, chapter 3, <laughs> the tongue. And right at the uh, middle of that chapter, verses uh, 9, 10, and 11, 12, right in there. Uh, out of my own heart, my own words. Sometimes it's praise and blessing, and other times it can be as harsh as a curse. And so uh, it's not disconnected from our relationship with God, it's that vertical relationship with God, but that should impact me and all of my decisions, behaviors, words, choices, responses impact others around me. There's no neutral there. So the, one of the things that hit me, and this is really on when Greg was talking about the book, right in the very first chapter, James starts off with uh, to the 12 tribes that are sp dispersed amongst the nations. And um, Greg always challenges us to think about the context of what's going on when you read these things. And here's, here's James staying in Jerusalem with a remnant of the church that's gone through just a horrendous persecution. And um, we read about a little bit with the Apostle Paul as he was out leading the uh, religious community to find and persecute and kill folks. And uh, folks just had to leave Jerusalem because it, it was... Uh, it was a horrendous place to be, and they, they went everywhere in the Mediterranean. And um, I just thought that if we were writing that letter today in our American church culture, we'd write a letter saying, hey, it's okay, uh, we're having a prayer rally, you know, at the Capitol to uh, pray against the government and ask the government to get their act together, and we're going to work really hard to get you guys back home. And, uh, you know, these are the things, you know, we're, we're talking to these senators and all the rest of these people, and we're going to pray for them. We're going to ask God to break their hearts that they would allow you to come back. And James doesn't mention that at all. He, he doesn't, he's not talking about bringing anybody back. He's not talking about the government. What he's talking about is the fact when, and I'm just thinking about these folks who got dispersed. They're showing up at a synagogue with some other believers in Macedonia or Thracia or Greece or Rome and the folks there are doing fine because there's no persecution there yet and there they have nothing and what he's really focused on he says you know what in this situation you guys are the body together and some of you are rich and some of you are really poor and some of you are well connected and some of you have nothing and what I need to help you with is to understand how you function as a body of Christ together so that in all these hundreds of different little places you ended up, you, you, can, you can encourage one another, do all the one and other things we're called to do in the New Testament well and not let Satan have a foothold and be a light to that community. And that's, that's not what we would do today. And that just that really struck me uh, about that. And, and I also think a lot about there's the four million Ukrainians who've been dispersed now, the dysphoria of the Ukrainians. Uh, and uh, we need to be praying for them as they show up in Poland and Hungary and Czechoslovakia and Germany and England and some of the United States now and Spain and France and all those other places that the believers that are in that group can find a local body that would bring them in and do all the things <laughs> that the book of James called them to do. Before I read the, the book this last time, that wouldn't have been my prayer with all that stuff. So anyways, that's what really struck me. Uh, when 
I get to the end of the study of a book, uh, I try to write out the main lines of the things that I've been taught uh, or think I've learned uh, over the course of it. And uh, one of the things that, that um, well, there's one major thing and two subsidiary things, so I'll mention the two in relationship. But the key passage for me is James chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. And I would really encourage you to mark that passage out. I think that's the core of the book. And what James says there is God is good. And he goes real careful to say God is good and there's not one iota of darkness in him. He's not attracted to anything that's evil. He doesn't move anyone to do what's evil, but evil comes from below. And God never changes. He doesn't shift or vary. And so every day he's good and he's always good. And so uh, anyone who believes that God is good uh, and that every good gift comes down that you need for life, well, then he's going to be at the center of everything. When you're, uh, as, we, as he wrapped up the book, he said, well, if God's at the center, if you're going through a hard time, you're going to talk to him about it and, and get some orientation. If you're going well, you're going to give him praise and thanks because he's behind it. If you're life-threatening in issues, you're going to call other righteous people around you because in the darkest times of life, you want the people who are walking as close with God as possible to help you stay on the right path and not forget your identity and who you are. Uh, and so James is dealing with people that are in just really, really difficult circumstances. And the other thing that, that comes out of that is that he is inside their circumstances. We hear a lot about empathy today. And James has empathy for them. But the things that's interesting, because he believes God is good and all the good resources come with him, his empathy never causes him to abandon God in the face of the tears and the problems of the people. The only answer for their tears and their suffering is to put God back at the center. Not to try to recast God or to try to change uh, God's expectations, but he continually calls suffering, difficult people in difficult situations to believe that God is good and he's always good. Thank you, uh, elders, for sharing your thoughts with us on the book of James. We'll get to uh, the question uh, phase now. And I just want to encourage you, uh, I think Sarah has gotten a few questions over text. The only text I've gotten so far is from my wife, and she says, I love you. I don't think, <laughs> I don't think that's meant as a question to the elders, but, <laughs> but Steve says he loves me. Too. I appreciate that. So please don't be shy. There's another number up there too. Um, don't leave me out. But, you know, one of the things that they challenged us with as moderators was to come up with a couple questions just to kind of prime the pump and get us started. And I was thinking about questions yesterday, and I thought, man, if I ask this, Pastor Greg, could I think I wasn't paying enough attention during the sermon. Uh, please don't think that, right? Maybe you missed that week, or maybe you just want to explore it some more, right, and, and hear their hearts on that. So don't be shy. Keep the questions coming, and um, if we can't get to them based on time, we'll have a record of them, right, and, and we'll follow up later. So... That's kind of some ground rules to, to go. So, so um, but a question for you all to get us started. Um, Pastor Will talked about this, you know, putting it in context. Who is, who is um, James addressing? And, and we see throughout the book that he uses, this is kind of a two-part question. He uses some pretty harsh words throughout the book, right? He, sa he says things like, you murder, you double-minded, you adulterous people. Uh, you're doing things by fraud, right? And so, you know, I, I, I kind of think I know the answer to this one, but is he really talking to those in the church? Can, can that be? And then the second part of that question is, as we think about that, uh, and this is more practical application for EBC, are there things corporately that you all see or that we could see that God would be calling us to repent of uh, along those lines. So let me kick that over to the elders, to whoever wants to start us off. Yeah, okay. Well, the one thing is I think that James addresses his congregation in the same way that uh, I as a pastor or any of the pastors here might address here. I know, I'm pretty confident that there's a whole host of people in here who know Jesus. And I'm also aware that there are people who, here that don't know Jesus, and I've known some of them for a long time. Uh, some people are here that are trying to figure out Jesus, figure out whether or not where they stand or they're revisiting something earlier. 
And so when he addresses, uh, I think he's addressing a mixed audience of people, but the way he addresses each one of them, he assumes that he's speaking to Christians because he always calls them brothers and sisters. That's his favorite title, brothers and sisters. And brothers and sisters is, well, we have a common faith in Jesus. We belong to the same family. And so what's kind of startling out here is that Christians can really screw up their lives and do some really ugly things. And I think that the issue that's going on where, for example, they're adopting the world's way of dealing with their difficulties and, well, we need jobs, we need, we need provision for our families, so we need to go suck up to people uh, who are powerful because we need help from them. And they invite them into their congregations and those people that they invite into the congregation curse the name of Jesus that they worship. But they'll kick Jesus to the curb because they think they need that powerful person more than they need to be faithful to Jesus. And so when James is, is confronting them, uh, he, he's very straightforward. And I think, I said this to myself writing about James, is that in a time of crisis, uh, we're being encouraged maybe in this present time to, to primarily weep and sympathize with people and allow them to behave any way they want to when they're wounded. But James, on the other hand, says when you're wounded, it's a very dangerous time and you need very clear speech, very clear ideas about what you should and shouldn't do in this moment. And so he pulls no punches. You don't have to worry about uh, James telling you what's going on. He says if you follow this path in chapter 4, you're an adulterer. You're unfaithful to God. So I think he's speaking to Christians and I think he gives us a model uh, of someone who's passionately a part of their circumstances. He's not aloof from it. He's not speaking holier than thou. But in a time of crisis, you need clear direction, uh, clear lines, and you need to understand the dynamics of what's going on. I was <clears throat> telling my faith and finance group, there's three kinds of people in the world. There's, the, there's family and there's fools and there's family that act like fools right? And so when God sees us, we're either part of his body or we're not, right? But uh, what we're constantly challenged to do is to put off who we used to be and put on Christ. And um, over and over in, in the book, he's challenging folks who are in terrible mind-crunching, physical crunching, spiritual crunching situations to encourage them to not give up hope and to lean hard on God. And on the flip side, he's looking hard at the folks who are not in those situations and saying, you're the one that's supposed to be doing the one and other things here for your brothers, and you're not doing it. You're taking advantage of them, you're judging them, you're casting them aside, and, and these are your brothers and sisters that have amazing value to the creator of the universe, and you're missing out on what I need to do. And I just, I'm always reminded of the times that, that Christ, we always think about Christ as the meek and the lowly, but let me tell you, there's times when he got fired up and upset. And it was when people were taking advantage of a position of shepherding or, or the truth. And, and he stood hard on that. And I think that's what you see in James too. So we got two questions from two different people pretty quickly, um, both based on James 5, 14 and 15, talking about healing if that is still something um, that happens. So um, the prayer of the faith will heal the sick. What is this talking about? Is our faith too weak when people aren't healed when we pray? Does that still happen in the church today, healing? Who wants to start that? I can take that. Uh, can, can, God do, can God heal? Can he do any of those miraculous things today? And the answer is yes, I think he can. I can't think he can do them at, at, at any time. The question that comes with regards to that is how we read James chapter 5, and some people read it, is that if you do A, B will always occur. And so it's a wrong understanding if we follow James all the way through. James told us back in chapter 4, uh, we can make plans, we can do things, and we, but we have to say, if the Lord wills. And one of the things we do know is we do know it's the Lord's will that if somebody confesses sin, it will be forgiven. Okay, we know that's the Lord's will. What we don't know, right, I'm, I'm looking at different people who have people in the hospital. Uh, we don't know the Lord's will with respect to any given person's physical state. Uh, or even if you were to add, which I think the weak idea here would encompass people with, with emotional or other kinds of weaknesses, anything that would disempower a person to make them there. Um, we don't know that, for example, if we pray for someone with autism that they will be healed. 
We don't know if we'll pray for somebody who has uh, a struggle with what we might call a bipolar disorder that all of a sudden that's going to go away. Uh, Paul, I'll just give you this example. Paul, if you remember him, God gave him a thorn of some sort. Uh, and he had that thorn and it was bad. And he prayed to God three times. And if you remember, you can read it in 2 Corinthians 12. And God answered him very clearly three times. No, no, no. Until Paul embraced the thorn and lived it. So when we pray for people's healing, I can pray confidently that if you confess to the Lord, because we know that's straightforward, you will be forgiven. You call on him, you will be forgiven. But when it comes to things that the Lord's will has not specified, uh, I don't know that he may heal you, he may not, right, in terms of physical healing. What I do know underneath of that, he's truly already healed every believer in Christ from everything that truly threatens them, right? Whether or not you're going to leave early or late in terms of your life, I don't know. But we pray for that with, with confidence that God can do it. But we pray, if the Lord will, uh, may it be done. Yeah, so uh, the, the model of Christ when he uh, prayed to the Father in the garden uh, certainly was, was uh, aware of the, the weight of the next few hours and uh, talked so openly and honestly with the Father. And then... Not my will be done, but yours. And uh, that's at the heart of prayer. It's, it's recognizing that God is perfectly knowledgeable and loving and powerful. And he will do as he chooses. And he invites us to, to be a part of what he's doing by waiting and watching and trusting as he responds. So it's, 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 a, it's just a beautiful... Uh, communion with God and knowing that he's God and yet he wants us to share from our hearts what we're thinking and feeling and pleading for so uh, yeah God may your will be done not mine thank you brothers uh, another question from one of our members uh, Pastor Greg was, had talked about uh, correcting others, uh, sternly correcting others when they're going through something and or sinning. And in the process of doing that, how do you do that without pushing them further away from God or from the church? Uh, one, uh, I'll say this about it, uh, how you go about doing that, James doesn't specify. We get one particular one. It would depend on a number of issues. It would depend on what the issue is that you're dealing with. That would be one of them. Uh, it would depend on how many people are impacted by the decision of the person. That would be really important uh, because if there's other people that are impacted, it would take a different situation. It would also be based on the nature of my relationship with them as a person. And, um, but it would always begin if I see somebody who's in trouble or I think is in trouble. It always begin with inquiry first, never a, a, a judgment with regards to what's happening. So the first thing I would want to do is come up alongside someone and say, you know, hey, brother, sister, I love you. Um, are you okay? Are things going okay? And then I would talk to them about what's going on. Uh, as a professor at Cedarville, uh, I send these emails out all the time. Uh, I have a student that disappears from my classes. Uh, I don't know why they would. They're the greatest classes ever. But they'll disappear and, and I, I used to come down on students, but now I, I, I send out a note and I say, hey, this is Dr. Kowser. I, I missed you in class today. I hope you're okay. Is there anything I can help you with? And when the person responds, sometimes there is something that I can need, help them with. Other times it's a sheepish, no, I just, uh, you know, I was outside today or something, right? But um, I want to begin with that. And then uh, how, how aggressively I go at it depends on what the issue is. But I think what James brings back to us, which is the uncomfortable thing, is that we need to follow the Lord toward the person. And the best thing I can be in any relationship is loyal to Jesus. And I, I want to be loyal to Jesus sometimes when somebody else is disloyal. And the best thing I can be is a person full of Jesus, representing Jesus. I cannot be responsible for how they respond, but I can be responsible for whether or not I represent Jesus well to them. And that's my responsibility before them. 
And so uh, I don't want to abrogate my responsibility to love them because it's uncomfortable or it's awkward or the fear of a downside. What I do know is something downside is already happening. So that's, that's a general statement. I think something that's really important too is a lot of times it's easy to look at the other person and say, okay, I'm going to help fix what's wrong with you, right? Because once you're fixed, everything's going to be okay. But the, if you look at in the, in the Gospels and look at Christ, uh, he, he didn't just spend three years with the disciples doing fixing of the disciples, okay? And they were knuckleheads, right? I mean, sometimes you, you, you read some of the things that they have to say, especially on the way to Jerusalem. You go, seriously, you've been with Christ for three years? Is this, is this really your observation here? Because I think I'd be done, right? But he led by an example in his life, right? So when they went to Samaria, the disciples said, hey, you don't want to be around these people. Okay, so you, you wait out here, and we'll get our hands dirty and come back. And they come back, and what's he doing? He's hanging out with the woman in the well, and he goes, hey, by the way, we're all going into town and spending a week there, right? Um, remember with the, when uh, and you look at it, over and over and over, he led by example. So I think our first, our first job is to say, is, is the thing I'm concerned about in them, am I, doing, am I living that in my life so they could even see that, right? And that just hit me in James where it says, be, be quick, what? To hear. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, right? And I think the, the best thing that somebody can, can do is, is, and I think a lot of times, well, I'm compromising because I haven't fixed you yet. No, well, you, you, don't, you don't want to dive into the sin with them, right, and the foolishness. But you, you want to live alongside of them saying, you know, you, you don't have to do this. And actually, life is really good. It's really joyful. And, and then say, hey, why don't you come over here with me, right? Mm-hmm. I think about um, Peter when, when Christ saw him after the resurrection. And, and he betrayed Christ, right? And, and what, did, what did he say? Hey, do you love me? Because I'm going to give you the most valuable thing I have, my people, because that's what I died for. Come do the things I did, right? Yep. Amen. That, that's powerful. I, I think um, just to follow up to that a little bit, you know, we see James say, be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. And, and we see him say, uh, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And, and Pastor Will pointed out there are times when Jesus became angry. And we see in, in the, the book of James, there are times when James is seemingly speaking angrily, right? To call people back, to prevent people from wandering off. So some comments perhaps on when it's appropriate to be angry and how to, how to go about that without, without sinning. I think mean, part of it is for us to remember that we need to be angry with the sin and not the person, right? We talk about loving the sinner and hating the sin, and, that, and that's a part of it. Um, but even in, in a broader sense, it's when we are going about it and we, we feel that going in, it's important for us to approach it even as, as, as it's been prescribed to us in Scripture, rather than attempting to go on on our own and, and certainly in our, in our own wisdom and how we think it should, should feel. Um, you know, if you see somebody in sin, you approach them. And if they are not responsive, you, know, you don't need to get angry with that. You bring another person along with them. And if they're not responsive to that, you take it to the whole church. And, and that way, one, it, it kind of keeps you out of it and it keeps you dealing with the issue. And you're not circumventing the process. And you're not, you're not kind of making this about how it, it feels. Um, because we, we are very quick to kind of circumvent the process because, oh, well, that doesn't seem gracious enough. Or, or that feels too judgmental. But if we just do it the way that it's been prescribed to us in the Bible, dealing with an issue with the sin or, or something like that, then it allows us to kind of, in a sense, distance that and, and avoid the anger part of it. Um, I'll let another one, if you want to address the issue of when it is appropriate to get angry, but. Um. Uh, 
So, as uh, believers, we, we all have uh, the opportunity, the responsibility uh, with one another, to love one another, and to love one another towards Christ. And uh, it's wrong to, uh, to go and <laughs> report that to somebody else, what somebody's doing, and expect somebody else to step in and do that. Uh, we need to have the, the courage and the boldness and the love to just go and, as Greg said, to listen, to ask questions. Uh, sometimes there is no issue. Uh, sometimes it's a really, really, really deep issue, right? And we don't know where it is in that that spectrum, but but to be willing to do that. And one of the reasons we don't want to do that is it's hard to do that because we don't know what it's going to lead to. And it might lead to a really, really big investment of your time and of your prayers, and you might have to say no to some other things because God is inviting you to walk with somebody away from their sin. And so, uh, that just takes a lot of courage and prayer and dependence on the Spirit to go towards somebody. Hard to cut us off when we keep the mics. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, James 2.12 talks about the law of liberty. I can read that for you real quick. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. So the question specifically is, what happens if a believer doesn't show mercy, and will God not be merciful to them? Uh, let me, just a couple things. This raises a, a, a larger question for um, the whole understanding of Scripture altogether. Uh, it's very clear that Every human being in Scripture, it makes it very clear that we're all going to have an appointment with Jesus as our judge. So he's often described as the coming judge of the living and the dead. Uh, the question that this one gets at is, well, what about the believer when we arrive before Christ at the end? There's been uh, uh, different ways of describing this. The judgment seat of Christ is one that's referred to in different ones. But James and, and Jesus too, and Paul, all talk about the fact that the believer is going to have to give an account for their life. And, um, but that account is not an account that you come before Christ and wonder whether or not you're going to be received or a son or a daughter. You come before him as a son or a daughter. And then you're assessed based on the way you have given, the way that you have utilized the resources that Christ has given you. So if you want to look at the, a passage that Jesus talks about this, you can look at um, uh, uh, Luke chapter 19, if you want to read this later, the parable of the Minas. Or if you want to see it in Paul, you can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where he talks about believers being held accountable. And I think that's believers in general in 1 Corinthians 3. And so he talks there in, in three, he used the imagery when you stand before God, that some of the things you do will be burnt up, meaning that they'll be found to have been uh, worthless uh, uh, activities, a worthless service, if you will, and they won't stand the test of uh, Christ's judgment. And so there's no fear in a believer in serving Christ that somehow I need to do the right things or I won't be saved. I'm secure in him. But there's the motivation of love that if I do know Christ, then I want my service to reflect the love that I've received in Christ. And I'm held accountable for that. And I do think that there's, a, there's the, the truth is that in this life, I think James means both, if you're a person who's merciless, you will be a person who will not receive mercy from other people. And I think that your judgment before the Lord will be strict. And he even says this with regards to leaders in chapter 3, if you want to read that in chapter 3, verse 1. Don't desire to be teachers really quickly because you'll receive a stricter judgment for being one. Because you, the impact of your life, the influence of your life has great, great import and great effect. And so God holds you accountable for it. 
So there will be a reckoning. There will be an accounting before the Lord uh, for the way we use our lives and our gifts. Um, what that actually will mean in, in, the, in the future time. The scripture doesn't say a whole lot about that. I'll just add, add to that that so we, we, we unfortunately we relegate 1 Corinthians 13 to weddings and then we, we read it and we go, oh, isn't that beautiful? And then we set it aside. But that's really our call for everyday life. And, and God says, you can do all these amazing things, and, and if you do it without love, it's meaningless, right? It's, it's harmful. And I think a lot of times we, on the judgment side, in that passage in James, it says judgment, it says mercy triumphs judgment. And we, we need to remember our job isn't, we're not out as the fruit inspectors to find all the rotten fruit and set them out of the basket and keep the, the good fruit in the church, right? Because the rotten fruit needs to stay outside. The, we're here to look towards redemption, right? That's our goal. And even when people are messing up and screwing up, we're not, we're not to go set them outside. We're, we're, we're supposed to be working towards their redemption because uh, that's what Christ came for, right? Was to bring us into the love of the Father and the Holy Spirit and himself. And when we see our brothers and sisters are doing something that's setting themselves outside of that, we, we need to be quick to say, you're, you're living a life that's terrible, and I want you to invite you back into joy again, right? So a lot of it, I think, has to do with our, with our, with our motivation there. Amen. We're getting a lot of good questions now. Appreciate it very much. We've got about 10 minutes to go. So if I can kind of put the elders on the spot and look for a head nod, um, we'll, we'll keep going for 10 minutes, but we'll roll up these questions into something over, over email with some the questions and the, and the responses as well. Does that sound good? Uh, just to make sure we don't lose anyone's question. I don't know, I don't know that we'll be able to get to them all. What I'm going to do now is, is to take a couple of questions and kind of paraphrase and combine them. Uh, some really well-crafted questions here. So um, this is James chapter 2, and faith and works. But that's really not the comparison, is it? Faith and works, right? And I think that's maybe key. So um, one of our members points out that Martin Luther actually called uh, the book of James an epistle of straw. He didn't, he didn't like it, didn't care for it. That's remarkable, right? It's a book in the canon of Scripture that the great reformer, didn't care for. And then, um, so if you could comment on that. And then a uh, related question uh, from another member. James 2.17 says, faith without works is dead. Do you think that means losing salvation? Can it be revived? I don't like it either. <laughs> any, any book that holds me to the fire and holds me accountable is hard to read, and I, I struggle because I know that everything in it applies so deeply to me, and and yeah, and how often my faith and my works don't align. So, uh, so because we're short on time, I'll just say no. I don't think it's talking about being able to lose your salvation. It's just saying that if the faith is there, if a genuine faith is there, then the the works that our evidence of that faith would be there as well. So, and if there's no evidence, then there's a question of the faith in the first place. Yeah, I, don't, I think between Paul and James, they have the same relationship. Faith precedes works, and uh, works are an outgrowth of faith, but they are an organic outgrowth. And what gets uh, even believers in us as we think about it, well, how do you know that, that a sufficient amount or whatever. Well, your, your, your salvation is not based on what you do. It's based on the trustworthiness of the person you put your faith in. And so faith is what you abandon yourself to. But if there's no evidence of a change of heart or mind, and, and how, what, how would it show up? Well, no sensitivity to sin, uh, no desire to be with the people of God, all the kinds of things that are like that, you can have uh, issues. And if you had somebody who said, right, James is dealing with two types of people, his two people, you know, I have faith, I just never show it in how I live. And James says, well, that's not genuine faith. That doesn't, that's not faith at all. And Paul would agree with the same thing. He has this phrase in Romans, or he says, I'm bringing the Gentiles to the obedience that, that comes from faith. 
So it's a package, right? You're going to have that. And so somebody who's, who's telling me, well, I, I, you know, I follow Jesus. I just don't care about any of the things that Jesus cares about. And I said, I don't know if you know Jesus. Now, only you know, and God knows whether you do know Jesus or not, because Christians can behave really badly. But, but there's something wrong with an understanding of faith that doesn't impact and change your life radically. And so it doesn't, you, can't, you can't put Christians on a growth chart and say, where are you at year two? Oh, here you should be, right here in degrees of holiness. There's no such thing. And Christian life often shows itself up unevenly with maturity in areas and immaturity in others. But there will be a change of heart and mind. There will be a new set of appetites that are made possible. And God will be at work in you by the Spirit to promote those. So, but if there's someone who just says, I have some faith, but it never, uh, it never pictures any of the change that's happened in my life, James is saying, uh, that's the same kind of faith that demons have. The demons know that God exists, but they don't worship him and serve him. The fact that you know Jesus exists is not, a, not taking him for who he is as the one who must save you from your sin that you've committed. He must deliver you because he's the only one who can. And the only way that you can benefit from what he's done is if you turn from yourself and everything else and put your trust in him. So Greg, let me, let me push off yeah. that because one yeah. of the questions that we got was on, in 224, it talks about not faith alone. You see the person's considered righteous by what they do and not faith alone. And that's confusing mm -hmm. because you're saying, well, but it's not faith alone. And you're saying that's more based on how we can gauge not based on our salvation. Yes. Well, the, the famous phrase that people put in is salvation is by faith alone, but faith is never alone. Salvation is by faith alone, but faith is never alone. And so it's the, it's the issue here where we're clear, both James, is our works don't earn us salvation. Our works don't keep us saved. Our works are a demonstration of a reality that's already happened. Okay. Right? So that's why James says there's no such thing as somebody who says, I believe that God exists and so forth, and then their life is not changed to fit it. That's not a saving faith. Uh, James 3, 13 through 18, 18 talks about wisdom from above. What are ways believers can receive and live by this wisdom? I'll keep it really short. It's, <laughs> it's the word of God is the wisdom is displayed there. I think when he prays in 1, 5 and he says, God, give me wisdom to deal with this hard, this hard situation. I don't think James is talking about give me a word about what I should do right now in this moment. I think he's, he's wanting uh, to get connected with the truth that God is good, he's always good, and this is his will and his way, and it keeps you oriented in the midst of a crisis so you don't, you don't lose your mind, you don't lose heart, and, and you don't head off after some false savior to try to get through it. So that's why he follows up that section with, uh, you're a person who reads the word of God to do it. And so you're a hearer that does. And I think, you know, in, in addition to that, that's one of the reasons we pray, right? He says, if any, any of you lack wisdom, let him pray. And so he, here we are at any instant of any time of day, we have ready access to the creator of the universe, right? And we have his spirit is in our hearts to convict us and to guide us with that. And, and the other thing is we're, we, we have an amazing opportunity to hang out with people with wisdom, right? Who are doing the things that Greg are talking about. And um, I think... I work with folks over at the, the uh, our, our adult shelter, and uh, everybody in this room, if, I, if you're honest with yourself, you have 10, 20 wisdom connects that you can make a week, either with people or with uh, teaching or with God's word or through prayer or for Bible studies or just go on and on and on. And I, I run into people constantly that they have nobody and nothing. They have no none of those opportunity points. And so there's, there's a reason why we do the one and other things is to allow us to observe folks with wisdom and let them do like it says in, in uh, Proverbs, iron sharpen iron, rough, get those rough edges off. If you're never around another piece of iron, you're never going to get sharpened with it. Yeah. So uh, 3, 17, and 18, those, those words there describe a, a spirit-filled person. Uh, you put those words on your refrigerator. You memorize those verses. Uh, when you are praying for your family, 
when you're praying for your church family, you pray that those things are true for them. Uh, you know, our, 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 our prayers so often get, get uh, overwhelmed by the immediate needs that we're concerned for. But uh, James would say, this is what God's people really need. And so let's just keep it before us. That's what it is. Amen. So I think we're going to just wrap up with one final question and then have a uh, close, in, close in prayer for this section, that portion of the service. So let me, and there's, there's some uh, questions that we didn't get to. Thank you for submitting them and we'll follow up. Let me just press a little bit harder on what I, I started with. I just want to give each of you an opportunity, should you choose, and this might make them squirm a little bit. Oftentimes when we hear the Word of God, we're called to apply it, we're convicted, we're called to repent. God asks us to change something, right, in response. I want to go back to this idea of corporate response in the book of James. And, and what do you see that our church family needs to say, Lord, we're sorry. We need, we need to do this better. We need to respond. Well, I'll work out from me uh, here. Um, I've told this to many different people. The, the, one of the biggest impacts of the book of James that, that has actually filtered into Ron and I's conversations is the role that pride plays in my relationships with other people. And you, you recognize as you know people and you interact with people that the vast majority of the decisions you make and the expectations you have for the other person, uh, they're not thus saith the Lord expectations. Um, uh, and I find so often in, in my own marriage, in my relationships, I get upset with the people in my life. Uh, really, if you were to boil it down to the bottom, is they don't do what I want them to do. And that's not that they're not obeying the Lord or following the Lord. They're just not doing what I want them to do. And this happens between Ron and I. This happens between me and my colleagues. It happens between me and my adult children. It happens between all those. And, and my pride rears up and I want to judge them and speak ill of their spirituality because they are not doing what I want them to do. And so instead of God being the lawgiver, I'm the lawgiver and I'm the judge and jury. And that, that is a pervasive thing to repent of. And when you're in a church, right, we've been here, this is perennial. I don't know how the perennial in every church is, churches split and divide and die and get anemic because we have competing kings and queens who want their way and people aren't doing everything that they want them to do. And so their expectation is this program should be like this or we should have that or we should do these things. And nobody bothers, I don't say nobody, we often don't bother to say, are my expectations really about trying to promote what God wants or am I really just upset because I'm not getting what I want? That, that's the, one of the biggest takeaways. Uh, just have to repent to my wife, have to repent to people, have to deal with past disappointments in people that were really about me setting up arbitrary standards that they didn't meet and then me getting grounds to not be happy with them about it. So that, that would probably be the, uh, one of the major takeaways that I think is a perennial problem. We know that the evil one always wants to distract, divide, and destroy. Always. And he does that by elevating ourselves so that we become the judge and jury uh, and judge everyone else based on whether they conform to our expectations. I, I think... And I'm just going to go back to J J James wasn't worried about the government. He wasn't worried about all the external things. And this is election year, man. We are all wrapped up on that stuff, right? But he's talking about to the body of Christ. And he says, you guys, find yourself in a situation where you're a pretty eclectic mix of folks. You got rich folks and you got poor folks. And you got folks that are struggling and people are doing well. And he says, I just desperately want you to love each other, Right? And put off all the stuff that's getting in your way of doing that. And um, I don't know, I, I just turned 61 today. But uh, I showed up here at Emmanuel when I was um, 18 years old. 
uh, June when I was 18. And when I came here to Manual, this was a pretty monogamous place. Everybody was at Senior Christian Day School, everybody was with Cedarville University on staff or had gone there or graduated from there, and we all looked like each other, and we all had the same experiences, and it was really comfortable because we all knew what to experience. And if there was a basketball game at Cedarville, we didn't do anything because we all went to the basketball game. Now, I'm not saying that basketball games at Cedarville are bad, but, um, but so first off, I just want to encourage everybody that that's not what we look like today because that's not what Xenia looks like, right? Everybody in Xenia doesn't go to one school and have graduated from one university. We're a pretty eclectic group of folks. And some folks don't know where they're gonna to sleep tomorrow night, and some people have $400,000 homes. Uh, and some have grown up in the faith since they were two years old, and some have just heard about it last week, right? And so uh, we have a challenge every week to decide before the service and afterwards, who am I gonna to go talk to and who am I gonna pray for? And it's easy for me to find somebody that looks like me and has my experience and go do that, right? And, but that's not who Jesus went to. You look at everybody he went to. The disciples are heading over that way, and he's going this way to this other group of people, right? So I just encourage us all to continue to think about who are we going to hang out with and encourage, and maybe it's not going to be somebody that looks like me. Uh, James 4.17, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and does it do, doesn't do it since uh, it just can't be any more clear, but uh, in my heart and in our hearts, uh, we have so many justifications for not doing what we know we should do. And we don't often call that sin, uh, but God does. And uh, may God uh, just help us to do the good that he asks us to do. Oh, the answer for me, we started off this time talking a little bit about context and the, what the, who the book was written to. You know, this group of dispersed believers who are under hardship and persecution. And I think the answer for me is that... Well, part of that persecution is they were supposed to lean into God and lean into each other for this. Um, but we live in a culture where we don't have that persecution. And so we are so in love with the world that we don't lean into God and we don't lean into each other. We spend far too much time doing the things that we want to do, whether it's baseball or movies or you know, whatever, however we want to spend our own free time that we do not build into each other the way that we should. Our faith, our church family are not our priorities. We become our own priority. So if, we, if we're supposed to be doing things together, like we were talking about with the members that came on, came on the last couple weeks, that should be our priority. And it kind of really goes to what Van just said too. The good we ought to do. So. Amen. Good words. Thank you, brothers, for sharing your hearts with us. Let me uh, close this time in prayer, and the worship team's going to come and lead us. Father, we are so thankful for who you are, that you are love and that you are good always, and that everything that you do is done in love. Father, we're thankful for your word to us, your communication to us, for our Lord Jesus, for his death on the cross on our behalf, his resurrection, Lord, and the life that we have in you. We're thankful for adoption into your family. Help us always um, to be overwhelmed by that. Uh, we thank you for these men who uh, led us and are leading us so well through this book of James and onward. And Father, we... Um, we pray you would continually continue to work powerfully in our hearts and in our church family. We're so thankful for our church family, Lord, but we repent. We say, oh, we're sorry before you for our arrogance, for um, holding on too tightly to the things of the world. 
for not um, obeying you and seeing the good that we're supposed to do and, and, and doing it for remaining in our comfort zones, uh, whatever they may be, and not, and not being bold and brave and reaching out to others. So we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would um, convict us and uh, show us a better way. And um, by your power, we would change and we would be a light uh, to one another, to our community, uh, for your glory, Father. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.